Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from a windy Macomb, Illinois. Uh, windy, windy, the weather is changing. We're leaving these uh, beautiful spring-like days as we leave winter into spring, uh, beginning of March. And you know what? It, it was 70 degrees, and now it's going to kind of be back to seasonal weather. We're going to get cold and chilly. So uh, excited, I guess, for a return back to normal there. Um, we have got quite a show for you today. Our special guest is going to be Andrew Holsinger. Uh, he's a horticulture educator with U of I Extension as well. But before we get to Andrew and talking about our special event coming up that we're all planning together, we have to introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator Katie Parker in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hey, Chris, how are things going in Macomb? I'm just holding on to the fence post, trying not to blow away. How are things in Quincy? Yeah, just as windy. It's uh, I had to take my clothes off the clothesline because they started blowing off for me. So, <laughs> yes, I have some limbs hanging in the tree and I'm like, come on, fall, come on. fall. <laughs> I can't reach them with the. Post right. On. They're yeah. Like, they're like almost blowing like horizontal right now, but they're not falling so i'm just like come on are they already detached or do you have to cut them they're detached they're just oh, hanging there by like waiting a, for them to fall yeah, yeah. need them to fall and hopefully yeah so no one's outside now so perfect time to do it uh-huh oh yes and i know if we all get blown away we would be swept over to ken's neck of the woods in jacksonville illinois hey ken hello chris and katie this is definitely windy here too starting to cool off so the beer is going to come in handy again here soon. <laughs> That's true. I was considering shaving, but now I'm like, well, we'll just, we'll wait again. Keep for keep a few more day. weeks. Uh, but Ken, you look all cleaned uh, up in terms of, you know, your beard's been trimmed a little, I can tell. You got that haircut. Is there any special occasion happening today? <laughs> That's not why I got a haircut. It was getting too long. <laughs> 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 Nothing too special going on today. Oh, I haven't heard that. I hear someone is a year older. So happy birthday to you, Ken. As we sit here and record, you're at work. How dare you on your birthday? Thank you. That's that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the gray will start creeping in soon and you can become uh, uh, your your lifelong goal of Santa. So uh, they're already creeping in here. Here yep. are, so the white hairs. That's all right. That's all right. It's that uh, you got that mature look to yourself now that uh, it, comes, it comes with wisdom, mm -hmm. something like that. <laughs> well, uh, Ken, Katie, today, our special guest is Andrew Holsinger, and we all know Andrew very well. Um, so, Andrew, horticulture educator uh, located in. Are you in Hillsboro today, Andrew, or or near I'm there? I am in Hillsboro today. All right. Um, Andrew, uh, so thanks for being on the show today. We are going to be chatting about our event coming up. The uh, what what I'm calling it the it's the Good Growing Garden Day. Um, it's got a couple names to it, but you know we're we're going to be emphasizing pollinators on this day, and it is going to be on Saturday, March 27th. This is an online event. All four of us are going to be teaching uh, classes during that morning. Uh, and uh, so we're going to be focusing primarily on pollinators and native plants. And so, um, you know, Katie, I, as we kick this off and we were thinking about uh, what topics people are interested in, uh, you know, you're doing a session on hummingbirds. Is that something that you've done growing up as a kid and then now in your own home? Yeah, so it's always been something fascinating that's been fun to watch. Um, We've always been big into landscaping, and then we've always had multiple uh, feeders. We've never been any of the people that have, like, have you seen um, the people that just have, like, swarms of hummingbirds? That's kind of always been a dream, but it's never been an, ach an achievement. Um, and so we're kind of getting to that season where we would expect to have some hummingbirds and expect to see them uh, migrating back to towards the Midwest. Um, and so I just thought that would be a, a fun topic to talk about. What about you guys? Have you, do you guys keep bird feeders or um, hummingbird feeders or attract them to your yards? So we've, we've got a feeder. It's been sitting in the garage for a couple of years. <laughs> we keep forgetting <laughs> to get it out, but. Seems like that's the wrong place for it. Ken. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we have grown um, scarlet runner beans the last few years. And we've had a few hummingbirds show up 
um, with those because they have those real bright red flowers that they seem to like. So we've, we've had success with the plants. One of these days we'll, we'll actually get the bird feeder out and, and set it up for them. All right. Um, my mom gave me a beautiful blown glass uh, hummingbird feeder, which um, I, you know, we had it set up in the garage away for the winter time. And I was reaching for something this last winter and something got knocked over and it was a ball shape and it rolled and it smashed on the floor into a thousand pieces. So that beautiful hummingbird feeder is, is no more. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to get another one because like Ken said, we have a lot of columbine in our yard, which they love. Um, another one that we have is a Tiarella cordifolia. And I believe that's foam flower. Uh, I think so, right? Eh, sure. I know my scientific name is better than my common name sometimes. So uh, yeah, Tiarella cordifolia. Um, I believe it's called foam flower. Uh, I see them on there. It's right outside our window. They're they're munching on that thing all the time. So they they really like that. And I, I, Katie, I thought it was interesting when we had uh, Dr. Michael Ward on uh, a few weeks ago. He said, you know, in terms of bird feeding, most of the stuff we do in the backyard doesn't matter. But the hummingbird feeders that might be something that they think is helping to sustain that hummingbird population. Right. Yeah. And I think too a lot of what I found is a lot of people suggest combining the two. Um, and so that way they can, they can go to the flowers or they can also go to the nectar feeders as a source as well. Um, and so I think that it, it's good to do the combination of both, or even if they stay in the garage, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a hope of that too. So. Well, Andrew, I know you have the hummingbirds. You just put the nectar on your on your lips, right? And they come up and they give you little kisses. I've, I think I've seen that video before. Oh, actually, my uh, wife's Aunt Paula had a, a hummingbird with a close encounter that it actually just about flew into her mouth. It was uh, pretty amazing. And I've had my own close encounters of uh, hummingbirds. Uh, one, we found... Uh, it was down on the ground and it might have been injured or somehow impacted and it, it stayed there for quite some time and I even took a, a video of it and it was just kind of neat to see the coloring and how uh, distinctive it was and we have uh, some flowers that attract the hummingbirds, the Rose of Sharon, so we have those blooms and they tend to attract those hummingbirds and we have uh, quite the fancy of being able to see them as they visit our landscape. And so that will be Katie's session. Katie's going to be kicking off our uh, Good Growing Garden Day. Uh, and kind of the other name we have for it is the birds, the bees, the flowers, and the trees. So it's uh, a take off uh, the old, uh, what, who, what was the artist, Ken? I think you're the one who, who mentioned that, some, the song artist that wrote that one. Uh, I'm not sure who wrote it. Um, I mean, a lot of people have done it. Dean Martin was one person that did it. That's the one you talk about. Yeah, <clears throat> Dean Martin. Yes, so... Uh, uh, so in terms of the birds, Katie's going to be talking about hummingbirds, how to attract them to their yard. But, you know, Andrew, you got me thinking about Rose of Sharon. I had a Rose of Sharon in our backyard, uh, before, and, you know, that was a favorite place for bumblebees to, uh, spend the night was in the flowers of that shrub. Uh, I would come out in the early morning, there would be bumblebees resting inside those flowers. It's pretty neat to see. And speaking of which, um, we have Ken following Katie on March 27th, uh, talking about attracting pollinators uh, to your garden. So Ken, you've been talking about the uh, the insect pollinators, correct? Yes, the bees, and as well as some of the other pollinators that we maybe, not, we maybe don't think about as much. So flies, beetles, um, butterflies, all of those fun little critters. Well, Ken, I know uh, very often you talk about how honeybees tend to get all the attention. And, but as you mentioned, you're gonna be talking about other bee species, pollinator species, um, do you have any favorites though out there? Is there any, uh, maybe if, if we focus on bees, I can't, we can't include all the insect world because we'll be here all day. Um, but if we look at, if we focus on bees, is there any species that like stands out to, to Ken that's like, oh, that's the one that I want in my yard? I don't know if there's any kind of, kind of one species. Um, I don't know. I guess I like them all. I mean, I think it's, it's, you know, it's cool to see the bumblebees and stuff out there and, um, you know, a lot of the, the smaller uh, bees, you know, we kind of overlook those quite a bit. Um, you know, we, I've grown sweet corn the last few years in our garden, and there's some of the, like the male longhorn bees 
um, they will will kind of sleep on plants. They'll um, clamp onto the, the plants with their jaws and sleep there. So last two years, uh, we've got usually had a cluster of 15, 20 um, longhorn bees that'll sleep in our sweet corn. So kind of gotten to the point now I feel obligated to plant it because they kind of go to the same general area um, a lot of times. It's different bees, but they kind of hang out in the same area. So I feel obligated to grow corn every year now. So they have somewhere to sleep at night. So are a lot of these ground nesters? Um, so yeah, a good chunk of our, so kind of honeybees and um, and bumblebees, those are social insects. So they're in, honeybees obviously, we're, a lot of times are in our hives um, that we're managing. Um, then bumblebees a lot of times are in the ground um, and abandoned rodent burrow, stuff like that. But most of our bees are solitary and they're either nesting in the ground or they're mess, uh, nesting in um, cavities, whether those be hollow stems uh, from flowers, um, in beetle galleries and wood. Um, it just kind of depends on the species and how big they are and stuff. So we grow like for like squash bees, those will nest in the ground and um, we've grown pumpkin and squash the last few years. So now we've got some squash bees that kind of inhabit um, our garden. So kind of making sure we don't till up the ground too much and disturb those. Um, destroy those nests before they emerge and stuff. I, I'm kind of also thinking back to uh, the sweet corn that you were planting. Is do you notice any differences in foraging with with bees and sweet corn or different types of sweet corn, or do they? You think they all kind of prefer uh, similar cultivars or varieties of of corn? Like, could I plant field corn and get the same results of of bees feeding on that? Probably. So, like the longhorn bees, they're just sleep. I've just seen them kind of sleeping. But when I, when they're, the corn's tasseling, you go, I go out there and find a lot of smaller um, bees and wasps and even some flies on there visiting those tassels, um, feeding on the pollen and stuff. So, you know, while they're, while corn is wind pollinated, the insects will still utilize that as a food source a lot of times, other than the pests that are eating <laughs> your corn. <laughs> that's another, that's another show too, the, the corn pests and, and things we can do about that too, so. Um, so following up uh, with uh, talking about pollinators in the garden, I guess that is going to be me talking about wildflowers and grasses. And so focusing primarily on our native plants out there that we can utilize to help attract some of our uh, hey, hummingbirds and some of our uh, insect pollinators into our yards and some uh, maybe some favorites that are a bit more um, commonly found in the landscape trade. Uh, very often I see lists for native plants and they can be tough to find some of those plants. So we're going to try to identify some things out there that uh, won't be impossible for people around the area to find and locate some of those plants. And I'm excited to do in grasses because I think those are overlooked a lot of times when we're doing pollinator habitat. So, okay, I, I do have a, a question then, because right now um, there's a decision to be made. I know there's a lot of uh, like controlled burning happening in different prairie areas in our area. Um, and I've noticed some neighbors who have seen that they've started burning down some of their ornamental grasses in their landscaping. Now, I've always thought that's kind of good habitat, overwintering habitat for a lot of insects. So, should we be cutting that down right now? I mean, it's only March 10th and it, you know, it's still probably gonna be getting cold again here in Illinois. So I don't know, guys, what do you think? Should I be cutting down my ornamental grasses or burning it right now? I would wait. If you're thinking about pollinators and overwintering insects, I would wait. Um, a lot of times you wait until kind of general rule of thumb is when temperatures are consistently in the 50s. So when you'd put your tomatoes out, so mid-May. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, you got to take into consideration if you live in a homeowners association or there's different rules and stuff you have to follow. You may have to do it earlier, but the longer you can wait, the better. If your spouse doesn't like that answer, tell them to talk to me. <laughs> and would there be benefits too, like of cutting it? You, I know a lot of times we'll use like a hedge trimmer and just cut the grasses off. Would there be a benefit of doing that rather than burning it? Yeah. I mean, like, like for over, you know, if, if you're burning and there's overwintering insects in it, you're going to, potentially burn them Show up. It. I know as far as the plant goes, I'm not sure, you know, they may benefit more from, from the burning. I don't, I'm not for sure on that though. So I, I will wait to burn till I start seeing maybe some green popping up at the base and then 
and just make sure you're that's not too close to your house or a garage or a shed and burn that down or allowed in whatever place i live <laughs> <laughs> yes or the, wind the fire department factor. coming out yeah the wind wind is definitely a factor so um i we actually i was on a controlled burn last monday and there was not a prevailing wind it was a swirling wind that is um that's difficult when you're doing a controlled burn in a prairie so we had 11 acres that we were burning and yeah when you're trying to establish your fire line that that back burn area so that you don't burn down the whole county um that's tough when the winds go in all different directions I would recommend having uh, a, an army brigade of uh, people with hoses and buckets, and if you're actually going to be burning your grasses. So, uh, but I know it's pretty common where in my neck of the woods where I'm at. I don't know, Andrew, Katie, do you see people burning uh, a lot of their grasses and some of their landscapes where you're at? I have. Oh yeah. Already. I think this this fools fools uh, spring is really getting people active. Uh, I've seen yards sprayed. I've seen fertilizer applied and I just kind of cringe like, oh, not yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's people putting down grass seed right now, mm -hmm. crabgrass preventer. Um, you know, by the time the, the soils warm up enough where the crabgrass might be germinating, that preventer might have already leached out of the soil and right. been ineffective. So, yeah, it's uh, you're right, Katie. It's a full spring. It got mm -hmm. us all out and then about a little bit earlier than we usually do. Well, then at the end of our Good Growing Gardeners Day, we have Andrew. He's going to uh, finish up uh, with a topic on native trees and shrubs. So, Andrew, are, you know, tell us about your, uh, do you have a preferred list of uh, trees, native trees that you like or shrubs? Or are you going to save that all for the presentation and we have to wait? Well, I can give you some generalities. I, <laughs> I do like my native trees and shrubs and uh one thing to think about when, you know, your, your trees, they are large and they do have uh, a lot of sources for the pollinators. But uh, with that, their typical time frame of bloom is only a couple of weeks. So if you're thinking about planting trees or shrubs, it may be a consideration to look at what the span is of the bloom and how you can stagger that throughout the landscape and then provide more of a benefit for the pollinators over a duration of time and the the trees are important because they you know flower at a time oftentimes in the early spring when other flowers are not available so that uh, can be a benefit for the pollinators another thing that i've learned is that uh, with our wind pollinator species of trees uh, they don't have the nectar, but they have uh, quite an abundance of pollen that can be a source for the, the tree, for the bees or the pollinators. And larval food sources too, for caterpillars and butterflies and, and moths and all that. And that's uh, quite expansive on our native uh, flora of trees and shrubs that we have native insects. And so those are, uh, Ken's very correct in that they... Uh, make those for their habitat or food sources and uh, have designated host plants that you can find them on. And the nice thing is we typically don't even notice that they're chewing away at our oak trees and, um, you know, it's usually goes completely unnoticed, but uh, as, yeah, as everyone's saying, it's an incredible food source that many people overlook when it comes to pollinators and other beneficial insects in our landscapes. Yeah, I don't have too many samples brought in of, you know, chewed oak leaves or from caterpillars. It's, you know, like you said, overlooked and, you know, not necessarily thought of. And uh, it's kind of amazing how nature is so interconnected in the web of life and that it all works to, you know, provide resources for these insects and pollinators. I recall uh, a one a person called, you know, this is about a tulip poplar. Um, they called in, uh, they were getting sooty mold on their patio furniture under the tree, and that uh, is due to aphids uh, eating, chewing on the leaves, sucking on the leaves, and then their, their frass, their, their droppings is uh, this very sugary sweet uh, material that, you know, where it drops, it could create a mold. And I, I came in to look at the tree, and I'm seeing aphid, aphids all over the place, but a lot of them were 
aphid mummies, which means they've been parasitized, and the leaves were covered in lady beetle larvae, which are voracious, I guess, hunters of aphids. And it was amazing to watch. Yes, they had an explosion of aphids, but then the predators kind of rose up to meet that um, pest population, and they didn't have to do anything about it. It took care of itself. Nature's good at doing that. It's when people get involved, we <laughs> screw everything up. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the phone call was, what can I spray to get rid of the aphids and stuff? It's like, well, let's just let's wait and see what happens here. And so, uh, yeah, typically when when it comes to aphids, you know, usually what I recommend is if you must do something, get like a power washer and spray off the bottom canopy of leaves that will dislodge some of the aphids and you can knock down their population without necessarily harming many of the beneficial insects. So if we can avoid uh uh, putting insecticide on our large shade trees that that would that would be ideal we should minimize as many as as much pesticide use as possible yeah there are those natural eliminators of pests like the assassin bug and such and it's kind of nice to see those go to work but uh i also like to keep my distance from them a little bit Ken's pet he's pointing to is that a, what, what do you call a Ken surfit or Hoover fly? I always usually call them surfit flies. Okay. But yeah, surfit flies, flower flies, hover flies, corn flies. There's, I think, all kinds of different names. Mm -hmm. so, sweat flies, sweat bees. And it's always wonderful in the late season when they're landing all over people and people think they're bees or something. And, you know, it's like you can look real closely. You can see that it has, it looks like a fly with bee coloration. And yeah, those larvae will feed on aphids and yeah, they're another one of those voracious feeders. Well, folks, we do hope that you will join us for our Good Growing Garden Day. Um, there is actually, there's a cost to attend this and this cost is just to kind of reserve a spot uh, on the, the webinar. So it's very low cost, $5 uh, for attending four classes. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of good information uh, for you that day. So March 27th, we will leave a link below uh, to the registration in our show notes. So please check that out. But we also do have some questions uh, this week uh, regarding some of the topics that we will be uh, discussing. And so I think we'll we'll kick this off with a question to Katie um, and uh, about hummingbirds, and then maybe we'll hopscotch then uh, throughout each other's questions here. So so Katie, our first question uh, regarding hummingbirds. Uh, so this person is asking, when is the best time to put out hummingbird feeders? So when Ken and I replace the ones that we have hidden in our sheds and broken and all that, what, what, when should we be doing this? Yeah, so as we warm up, we can expect that the hummingbirds will start migrating north. Um, there's actually some nice migration maps that you can access online if you just Google like a hummingbird migration map. Um, They'll give you updates on where hummingbirds have recently been spotted. Uh, so that's something where just citizens can go in and uh, mention like that they've seen some in their area. And so right now, the furthest north that uh, hummingbirds have been spotted are in like Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so they are working their way north. For central Illinois, it's expected that hummingbirds are usually around here between April 10th and April 20th. Uh, for Northern Illinois, that's typically April 20th through May 1st. And then for Southern Illinois, that can be April 1st through April um, 10th. A lot of times they suggest that you put your hummingbird feeders out a couple weeks before uh, they're expected to be in your air area, just in case there's any uh, leaders of the pack that are coming uh, earlier in the season. Uh, so if we're expected here in central Illinois, anywhere between April 10th and the 20th, uh, you might expect to start putting those out April, the beginning of April. Uh, so that's your best bet. And again, it's fun just to track those uh, hummingbirds on those migration maps. Uh, so that's something fun you can check on weekly or every other day. Uh, see to see where they are. Katie, if I if I want to replace my broken hummingbird feeder, should I get like two or three or does it matter how many I put out? Because I've heard they like to fight. So what, should I have more than one? Yeah, they can be pretty territorial. Uh, so it is suggested to have more than one hummingbird feeder. So that way uh, you can attract more. And then that way, like you said, they aren't going to fight. I've been, I've been watching um, 
so there's live cams, uh, cameras of everything everywhere, you know, you can watch birds in Texas, uh, but there's one that I've been watching out in California, and this lady has like five or six feeders all within uh, a, a small space, maybe like a three by three space, and her hummingbirds don't fight, so I'm interested to do some more research to see uh, why they get along so well and what, she, what maybe she's doing. What what is she putting in that uh, right. bird food? Yeah, or maybe <laughs> since they're there all year and well, I don't know in California, maybe they're all friends. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Okay, so our next question is for Ken, and they're asking when is the best time to start cleaning my garden if I want to try and protect over overwintering pollinators. So, like we mentioned earlier, it's kind of that mid May time frame if you can wait that long. Um, that's best yeah, that goes into you know, cleaning up any leaves you have in the ground because uh, a lot of insects will overwinter um, in the leaf litter uh, whether those be caterpillars that are overwintering there's a few butterfly species that will overwinter as adults they can be in that leaf litter um, a lot of times those caterpillars are going to be near their host plants um, in that leaf litter or the, or the eggs uh, may be in that leaf litter as well so letting that kind of sit for a while until things really start warming up that's going to give those time for those insects to kind of wake up um, and start moving around. So the longer you can wait to get rid of that stuff, the better. If you do have to clean up, um, kind of be careful about it um, and maybe just put it up, put all that kind of yard waste, leaves, stems, what have you off to the side somewhere. Um, so if there is anything in there, um, they could still uh, kind of emerge down the road. Uh, well, when it comes to cleaning up, um, some of our flowering plants, you know, leaving some of those flower stalks behind, trim those off so they're anywhere between 12 and 24 inches long, kind of whatever you feel comfortable with. And again, those hollow stems from those flower stalks, um, there's a lot of bee species will utilize those as nesting material. Um, and you can just leave those and they'll break down over time. Once the plants start growing, that foliage will, will cover up those those leaf stalks or those flower stalks fairly well. And once they start sending out flowers, you probably won't notice them. Uh, very much anymore and then you know they'll, they'll break down on their own over time or next spring you could remove all those ones that you had last year once those bees have emerged um, so ideally wait a little bit if you can would be would be my recommendation for that and then our next question is for chris and this one comes from facebook um, <clears throat> so these people have an area that had three dying blue spruce trees uh, they cut them down applied lime and they let it go fallow for two years, um, but they're, they're afraid they didn't do enough homework originally to have a true pollinator garden. Uh, they applied a Midwest wildflower annual and perennial mix. First year it was pretty, second year not so much. Uh, they planted the perennial plants in amongst the flower mix with little success. Uh, they've ordered a mix of pollinator plants and have read they need to mulch around those without using weed guard under the mulch. Uh, they don't really wanna spend the entire summer weeding either. Um, and the area is way bigger uh, than the newspaper they have available. So what advice do you have for them for that? Oh, I don't know, Ken. Just keep burning it down over and over again. No, I, um, that, that's interesting. So I, we've kind of been going back and forth. I've been talking with this person on, on Facebook uh, about some of the, the, you know, some of the components in the seed mix, uh, looking at that, kind of uh, wondering a little bit, why did they put lime in this location? Um, based on a reply, I think they, it was just because they thought that the spruce trees would acidify the soil, so they just put down lime. Um, but you wouldn't know that unless you took a soil test, and so that would probably be step one. If you're thinking you might have something wrong with their soil pH, is to do an actual soil test there uh, to figure out your pH. Uh, but with that being said, you know, kind of with the question. Uh, is asking is it looks like sounds like they started with a seeded pollinator plot. Um, it was a mixture of perennials and annuals and the annuals flushed out that first year and they were beautiful. But then the perennials takes two, maybe three years to establish before you get really any decent flower show. Uh, so maybe it just hasn't been long enough that this person has has waited for those perennials to establish. Uh, you know, and again, those annuals would have bloomed that first year and then, you know, possibly not have come back that next year. Um, so, you know, seeding the area. Uh, typically when you do that though, you want to mow at least once uh, every year, uh, the first two to three years, you mow that. 
uh, at about a six inch height. Now this is to knock back any uh, annual weeds that might also be germinating with your, uh, with your desirable seed. Now, if you can keep those knocked down, your perennials established within about three years, uh, you'll start seeing flowering from the perennials within four years, you know, things really should be starting to come into, uh, in, into view. So it is a long process uh, when you go the seeded route. Um, sounds like though, they're looking to install some plant plugs as well. So um, that's kind of a different installation technique. Uh, so, you know, where, with the seeded plot, you kind of, you mow things, you keep things suppressed for those first few years while plants get established, but with plugs or pots, container plantings, you plant those, and then you use mulch usually in the in-between space while those perennials get established once again, can take two, maybe three years. Um, so it's kind of two different techniques to establish a pollinator plot. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Did anybody else have any thoughts on this situation at all? I can say for the the pond, the native plant kind of gardens that we've done, we've done it through plugs, and then we we put those in, and then we've mulched fairly heavily to keep weeds down, and it does a pretty good job until kind of later in the year where the weeds just kind of finally make their way through. But it does make it much easier um, mulching that, and we didn't do it all at once. We kind of did it. Uh, we did our, our boulevard hill strip, whatever you want to call it. We did it in two sections. We planted everything um, one half one year <clears throat> and kind of got that established. And then the next year we went and planted the rest of it. And then we kind of go through and, and fill in any gaps we have, um, you know, with, with flowers or, or grasses um, to kind of fill stuff in a little bit. So I, yeah, I would say it, you could mulch heavily. I, I, I would probably, if this was my situation um, and you have already seeded or spent money on uh, you know native plant seed mixture and have planted that, see what comes up this year. So it might require you to wait a little bit um, and, and see what might be emerging. Uh, there are some native plants though that take a while to emerge like milkweed. That's one of the last plants to come up uh, you know, later on in the springtime. So uh, you, know, you might mark those then you can determine how you want to shape that space with your new perennials that you'll be putting in the pots and containers. Um, and then as Ken said, mulch heavily. And so we actually had a new perennial bed in my yard, which we just used. We had an, a, a huge weeping willow that died. We had that uh, chopped up and chipped up and we just dumped it in our new perennial bed. And I remember uh, my mom came by and she said, oh, look at your new berm. It's like, well, it's not really a berm. It's just, it's a big pile of wood chips. So, <laughs> um, but they've decomposed down within the year and, you know, they suppressed the weeds, you know, the mulberry still came through and some grasses did, but it wasn't, it, it, the, the heavy mulch is, is really beneficial for that uh, to keep those weeds suppressed. So sometimes it can be a little surprising how much mulch we put down to keep those weeds suppressed. But yeah, I, I would say just, Consider, you know, trying to preserve what you've already done, if possible, and then plant what you will be ordering, the new container plants, and um, yeah, and then throw some mulch down if you, to keep those weeds suppressed. And then, and I would add, once you get everything established, I would cut back on the mulch some, um, maybe in some areas, and you have some of those um, bees that are, are ground nesting, so they're going to need kind of bare patches of ground um, if you kind of want to kind of get the full pollinator patch experience leave some of that bare ground for them um, and and once your plants fill in they'll kind of shade out a lot of the weeds to begin with that's a good point so it's, yeah leaving the bare ground for ground nesting bees the other thing i like that we had we had some just some dusty bare ground in our old house we would watch birds take dust baths there all the time that was fun to see uh, birds cleaning up in the dirt. Well, our next question is for Andrew, uh, talking about trees and shrubs. And uh, this one is about, uh, they're asking, how should I plant uh, native trees and shrubs in my landscape for the most significant impact on pollinators? Is there, an, uh, is there a strategy here, Andrew? Yeah, I believe looking at the bloom period is probably the most significant uh, aspect of that to find out when they're in bloom and Taking a look at probably the most uh, aesthetically pleasing, you know, there's a lot of trees, but some of the flowers go unnoticed, but uh, there are some that are very well noticed and you can uh, take advantage for, you know, your overall landscape plan to 
incorporate color from some of those blooms. I think of like uh, honey locust and uh, different, uh, the red bud, some of those in the Fabaceae family have a uh, you know, nice bloom to add to your landscape. All right, there's questions for Katie. I see videos of people with so many hummingbirds. How can I attract more to my yard? Yeah, so that's kind of the ultimate goal, right? <laughs> Who can get the most hummingbirds? Um, but I just think about it like when we're looking for homes, we have specific things that we need or want when we're moving into an area. Uh, and so when we have these hummingbirds coming, it's good that we create a habitat that's going to be good for them and what they're looking for. Um, so kind of the overall theme of what we've been talking about is just providing those native flowering plants, fine shrubs or trees. So if you can provide those uh, in your landscape, then that's something that would be attractive to the hummingbirds as well. Oftentimes with hummingbirds, they're looking for more red or orange tubular flowers. That's something that's very, fairly attractive to them. Um, it doesn't mean that your whole yard has to be red or orange tubular flowers. You can do a nice mixture of native plants and that should be attractive to them as well. And then if you can produce uh, different blooming periods throughout your yard, so that way you have that provided throughout the entire season, that's ideal as well. Um, they also prefer to have a, a supply of nectar and other food. So you can do that by uh, maintaining some shrubbery and small deciduous trees, um, and then they can build nests there. Uh, so if their nests are close to the food source, that's easier for them. They're not burning as many calories, um, and that's easier access for them. It also provides an area for them to perch or rest. So hummingbirds are a fairly small species. Um, and so they can be uh, prey to some other um, wildlife. And so if you can provide them um, a habitat that's safe or a place for them to rest, to survey territory before they go eat or something, that's also ideal as well. And then part of a hummingbird's diet are insects. So using insecticides in your landscape is also not a great practice. Uh, so that's something that you might consider stopping as well. And then like with a lot of our other birds, um, it's good to have a water source as well. So if you think about it, uh, we're feeding them sugar water. And so that can become fairly sticky. So if you can provide them with somewhere to bathe, that's an, a good idea as well. And then we also talked about our nectar feeders. So having a few different nectar feeders as a source, that's also a good idea. And we wanna make sure that we're cleaning these. So it's suggested that um, you can clean these every time you fill your feeder, which can be anywhere from like every three days or weekly, just depending on how quickly the hummingbirds eat that food. Um, and then it's also important that we're not feeding them. Uh, oftentimes we see like that, that red colored food that they sell at the grocery store or um, other larger stores. Uh, we can make our own at home, which is fairly easy. It's just like a one to four sugar to water mixture. And so that's the best, the best way to feed them too if we're doing the nectar feeders. What's your secret, Andrew, though, to uh, get them to eat from your mouth? The, the crash landing into your, was it so your aunt's mouth? Yeah, my wife's aunt, yeah. Wife's aunt. <laughs> You guys, red lipstick on. <laughs> Might be. It's just the whole singer's trait. That one that was out in the yard, it was amazing, though. I'll have to send you the video of that hummingbird. Mm -hmm. I've seen videos where people like um, just slowly get closer and closer to the feeder and see if the hummingbirds will let them get close. And then they finally like put the feeder in their mouth like to small ones. Mm. So maybe that's something to try to. I, I was so close to it. I could have picked it up. That's how close yeah. I was to this. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I'll just add that my parents' uh, patio furniture is underneath one of the feeders and I've been sitting there. The hummingbirds do relieve themselves. So just watch out. You might just get a little like sticky, like splash on your face. Like, what is that? It's like, oh, that's, that's the hummingbird flying by and just... Had to, had to go to the bathroom, so I just happened to be sitting right there.
Okay, so our next question is for Ken. And they're asking, I have a butterfly house in my garden, but I never find butterflies in it. What can I do to attract them to it? Is it truly a butterfly house if you don't have butterflies in it? <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately, I, I don't really have good news for you. Um, so butterfly houses, if you're not familiar with those, are kind of wooden boxes that have long um, <clears throat> kind of holes in them, uh, like strips that are holes. Um, and then the idea is that butterflies will go in there to roost or maybe even overwinter uh, in those. Um, but everything I've read is they don't use them. They don't really use them at all. Um, there's been studies done where they've, you know, checked these butterfly houses over a couple of year period, like 40, 50 houses at a time, and they haven't found a single butterfly in them. They will find all kinds of other insects like wasps um, will build their nests in there. Spiders will habitat them. Um, they found they found stink bugs um, overwintering in their um, lady beetles. So basically, every it sounds like almost everything but um, butterflies will utilize those. Sometimes the mice will chew those holes a little bit bigger um, and use the, that as nesting. So there's really not much you can do to, to get the butterflies in there. Um, they kind of have their idea of what they want. Most butterflies um, in Illinois don't overwinter as adults. There's only a handful of species. Um, morning cloak would be an example that will overwinter as a adult, but most of them are either larva, the, the caterpillars or pupa or eggs, or they don't survive and they migrate. So monarchs will migrate south and then migrate back. Uh, stuff like painted ladies will just die out and then every year they migrate up um, from the south. So a lot of times you'll see, you know, put in um, like bananas or kind of rotting fruit to attract them, but that doesn't work. You're probably just going to attract wasps and stuff like that. So don't necessarily need to get rid of them because they are good habitat for other things, but probably not the, the stuff you necessarily want in there. And our next question uh, is for Chris. So we have a mostly shade to part shade yard, but many pollinator plants seem to prefer full sun. What flowers that attract pollinators are recommended for part shade or under trees? So that's a very good question because I feel like that that's true. It seems like a lot of flowering plants that you see on like a pollinator list are, are full sun plants, Bob. And, uh, but there are some part shades and some full shade uh, type uh, flowering plants that you can put and say, if you have a, you don't have that full sun spot in your yard. So I'm actually gonna reference a publication that our, our colleagues, Eliana Brown uh, and Lane Kenoki put together. Uh, it's called uh, Native Pollinator Plants. Uh, and so this, they have a series of publications on the Indiana, Illinois Sea Grant webpage uh, under their publications or resources tab. And you would just search for it from there. Um, but it, it contains a list of a lot of really good pollinator attractive plants. And it indicates whether it's full sun, part shade, or full shade types. Now, you, on their list, there's definitely not as many um, native plants that are, you would say, like full shade. Um, you know, with that, you might look at some possibly non native but non invasive type plants. I know hostas can be really good, attractive flowering plants for some of some insects, uh, but you know, hosta may not be considered native in your neck of the woods. So, and it's, you know, a highly cultivated uh, plant in the landscape trade. But, you know, there's, there are other options, I think, outside of maybe uh, if, if you want to go beyond native plants. Uh, so talk with your nursery and, and see maybe what they supply. But I'll just share a few uh, that Eliana and Lane put together in their list. And, you know, I'd say, I think the, one of the first ones that comes to mind is going to be poke milkweed. Poke milkweed is, it's a native milkweed species, which tends to inhabit more of kind of that woodland edge habitat. So part shade, sometimes full shade. Uh, so there's many different species of milkweed in Illinois and poke milkweed is probably the more shade tolerant of them. Now I've grown swamp milkweed in the past and the swamp milkweed was in a fairly shaded area and it still performed very well. So it was, a, I would say, you know, partial shade situation for that. Um, I know people are a little bit scared of the uh, the solidagos, uh, the um, uh, goldenrods. Uh, some people think of them as a noxious weed. Some people equate them with allergies, which it's not. They're um, they're plants that are pollinated by insects. They're not wind pollinated, so you're you're not breathing in that pollen from goldenrod. 
Um, it's actually ragweed causing that in the in the uh, summer season there. There is actually an elm-leaved goldenrod that you can plant that's more shade tolerant than a lot of the other goldenrods out there. Um, so it will give you that pop of color. We've kind of talked about uh, today of having uh, season long blooms. So that will give you that late season. Uh, pair that with say a smooth aster, which will be blooming late in the season as well, uh, which is also part shade tolerant. Um, and so there, there's a lot of uh, interesting plants that you can incorporate into a part shade to full shade setting. And then I will throw in there, maybe not necessarily a pollinator plant, but if you have all of these flowering plants, I, from a design perspective, I would like to have another plant there to support them and kind of that, that supporting role character in your garden. Sedges do work really well in these situations, uh, part shade to full shade. Uh, so like gray sedge would be a nice, it could be treated kind of like a ground cover, could be maybe a filler plant in some areas, um, you know, as these other plants come in and out of bloom. So gray sedge, other types of sedges would work well in this situation. And I'll leave a link below to this document that I've referenced from. And there's uh, other plants out there that work in part shade on there. Just avoid the invasives, right? That'd be a good point to, to make that a lot of other plants can be invasive and just knowing how to utilize plants that aren't going to be invasive uh, can be a good role for your landscape. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of folks planted euonymus and, you know, winter creeper, things like that in the understories of woods and things, thinking it would be, you know, nice and it would be a pretty evergreen ground cover. They put vinca down uh, and, you know, they it, it, it winds up becoming a noxious invasive weed. Um, yeah, and you know, not necessarily contributing much in terms of like habitat. Uh, although the the winter creeper in my parents' front yard uh, is is great habitat for poison ivy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, our final question for the day uh, is going to go to Andrew again. Back to trees and shrubs. Uh, so this person is asking, what can they do to ensure that they get the best uh, kind of native woody plant for their site? What are some of those things to be looking for? I think uh, when it comes to any plant, native, uh, native does work well in our landscape. Uh, site selection. So do you have full sun? Do you have shade? Do you have partial shade? Some of these factors that we've already mentioned. Uh, what kind of soil type are you planting in? Uh, where is the tree in relationship to power lines or maybe your driveway? Or how tall is a shrub that you may have in front of a window? You know, oftentimes we find uh, problems where uh, things get too big for the location and uh, we don't want to spend all our time pruning. And oftentimes we, when we do pruning, we prune off the blooms of, of the plant when we prune it at improper time. But uh, just thinking about the overall aspect of your site selection and where you're going to be putting these plants and the impact that you can have with uh, you know, your pollinators, uh, you want that to be uh, a, a, a benefit to your landscape, but also know that it's not a no maintenance. You have to know the maintenance that's going to go into uh, caring for your trees and shrubs. And it uh, probably will be less with native plants because they're adapted to our area. But uh, I don't think any landscape is a, a no maintenance as far as lack of maintenance that you're gonna provide. You're gonna have to know uh, the cultural care for any plant that you put into the landscape and uh, try to accommodate the best you can. Well, that was a lot of wonderful information. So Andrew, thanks so much for joining us this week as we uh, promote our upcoming event, March 27th, Saturday, uh, kicking it off at 9 a.m. Uh, so it is, we're gonna be talking about birds, bees, flowers and trees. So folks, uh, you know, we will leave links to those uh, registration details uh, below. Uh, Andrew, we will see you then March 27th. All right. Abraham Lincoln was a native. So break out your Abraham Lincoln and sign up for the program. Well, I've got my Abraham Lincoln tomatoes right here. So <laughs> we'll be talking um, uh, with Andrew again, Ken, Katie, uh, we will be uh, 
talking with everybody March 27th. So please sign up, $5 fee. So we do have a short URL link. Uh, you can head over to go.illinois.edu slash garden day pollinators. That's go.illinois.edu slash garden day pollinators. We'll leave those links below. We do want to make sure that you sign up and register. We have a lot of great information uh, that we will be uh, including. This will be a fun day, a fun morning. Starts at 9 a.m. I will wrap it up by lunchtime, I promise. Uh, and uh, so, so please, again, folks, uh, check us out of the Good Growing Garden Day. Birds, bees, flowers, and trees. Ken and Katie, thank you both so much for being with us once again this week to talk about our upcoming Garden Day. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for joining us. And Chris and Ken, it's always a pleasure. Yes, thank you, Andrew and Chris and Katie. Let's do this again next week. Thanks oh, we will probably do this again next week. Uh, we have uh, more episodes in the pipeline, folks. Uh, we are going to be talking, uh, coming up later this month with our, I guess this is all of our boss, uh, Dennis Bowman. Uh, so he heads up the Ag and Natural Resources team on campus for extension. And so, but Dennis is going to come talk to us about drones. Uh, this is an emerging technology in the world of agriculture, natural resources, and horticulture. So Dennis is gonna come by and talk to us about drones and using drones later on this month. Well, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best and that is listening or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.